Coming up next, we are very honored to have a power chat session with Mr. Chris Tran, head of eSports, Southeast Asia, Hong Kong and Taiwan, Riot Games, and Mr. Sean Jang, CEO, Thailand eSports, on the topic of building a win-win eSports partnership in the new normal. And Thailand eSports is a member of the Cyberport community. So before we kickstart the session, let's have a quick trivia to test your knowledge on League of Legends. In 2020, which sport property did League of Legends beat on the list of the most marketable sports properties? A, NFL, B, Formula One, C, Wimbledon, D, all of the above. Make your guess now and we'll announce the answer at the end of the session. Now, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please welcome our speakers, Chris and Sean. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk to everybody here about Riot Games. So in short, Riot Games were a game company, but also the founders of what we consider the world's biggest, newest sport. Um, and of course, we, we're here to talk esports, but when an esport gets big enough so it can compete head to head with sports like football, baseball, basketball, et cetera, then we, we, we like to think that we've been able to buy the ticket into the same kind of conversation that the big boys are. And for us, that ticket looks like having 125 pro teams, 100 million players globally, and roughly around 100 million viewers during our world championship in 2019. Um, we've just recently had a world championship in for 2020, which Talon was a part of. And uh, unfortunately, we haven't been able to get all the audited numbers back yet from a research company. Um, but with that, having a great game and having a great sport actually gives us the opportunity to push forward and change the way the world looks at gaming. So we're putting our game across not just sports, but also music, fashion, film, and art. Um, you know, with sports, for example, we are finding that some of our professional players are actually in the same sponsored campaigns with guys like LeBron James. So here we see Uzi Ai, uh, a player from uh, China, who is in the same campaign as, as Nike, that has been put on by Nike. Um, with music, we've been finding incredible success creating K-pop, hip-hop, and even heavy metal bands <clears throat> um, around our character and IP. So we released uh, The Baddest uh, about a month ago, and we've already had around 400 million views on uh, YouTube and over 300 million view plays on Spotify. And, and as we continue to use video to tell our stories, we partnered with Netflix to distribute uh, stories on not just our esports games, but also the behind the scenes stories of how we bring the esports to life, either from an event organization point of view or even the beginning DNA of how Riot Games came about. And as we continue to push the limit on what gaming and esports can, does, we are able to actually partner with a lot of different companies that people never thought would partner with an esports game. For example, here, um, we partnered up with Louis Vuitton for um, the carrying case for a fashion collab, and as well as some of the character designs within League of Legends, our premier game. But really, our league, our journey of a game company was about the first 10 years of League of Legends. Uh, last year, we celebrated our 10-year anniversary, and over 2020, despite a very hectic and frothy year, we were able to launch multiple games. Um, in May, we launched Legends of Runeterra, a new collectible card game, and then we followed that up with Valorant, which is... Uh, one of the hottest, newest tactical FPSs out in the world, and actually broke the single-day viewership record for Twitch globally. Um, and just recently, we've launched League of Legends Wild Rift, which is our mobile take on League of Legends, our flagship game. Um, but, you know, we're trying to be more than just a game company, uh, and, and so heading forward into 2021, we're we're hoping to be able to like show the world the more story-driven aspect of what we do. And that will start off with Arcane, which will be our foray into long format video storytelling. Um, we'll also be re uh, releasing our first 
non-competitive game, which is a single-player game called Ruin King. Um, and the team that has put all of that together is a team of 3,000 people that have been working in 2020 from their apartments, their houses, um, distributed in all the way that COVID's kind of like separated us, unfortunately. Um, but normally we're actually collected across 20 different offices and in Southeast Asia, uh, our office is in Singapore. Um, and we serve from Singapore players in Hong Kong, Thailand, Vietnam, Taiwan, Philippines, Malaysia, Singapore, and Indonesia. Um, we're very lucky and we're honored to be able to serve all of the millions of passionate players who are excited to just spend some of their free time with us, right? And use our, our products to really um, accentuate and make more enjoyable the free time they elect to spend with each other. Um, so from Singapore, things that we're developing specifically for the SCA market is our flagship League of Legends Esports League, the Pacific Championship Series, which we are once again lucky enough to work with Alan and Sean on, um, and we'll probably get into that a little bit more later. Um, as well as 2021, we'll be kicking off our new Valorant Esports competitive system. So it'll it's called the Champions Tour, um, and it will be a collection of different tournaments from all across the world, culminating in the World Championship Champions event um, in fall 2020. So that is just a little bit about what Riot is and what we've been doing in the last 20, 12 months and what we hope to do in the next 12 months. And uh, like, it's not the whole story, but hopefully it gives you enough of the beginning of the story so we can like share a little information uh, laugh a little, cry a little, and plan for a glorious future together. Yeah, thanks guys for uh, joining in on Delft today and, and the presentation that we have with Chris, who's the head of SCA. And Chris, thank you very much for that very detailed presentation around sort of right plans going forward, which sounds super exciting. Um, for those of you who don't know, my name's Sean. I'm the CEO of Talent Esports and here moderating the, this particular panel. Um, Chris, one of the first questions I wanted to ask, I think, is, is is around the titles that you guys are releasing. Obviously, you know, Riot has been very much focused on League of Legends as a competitive esport, and you mentioned within sort of your presentation a number of new IPs which are looking at new genres, new platforms, and even sort of new, like, storytelling features and single-player games. Could you share a little bit more sort of around the, the strategy and thinking around sort of broadening the sort of horizons outside of League of Legends into all these new IPs? Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm super excited to share the story, but I'm not sure if it's the most um, useful of stories, right? Because uh, I think I've, I've been at Riot for almost five years now, Sean, and in the five years, I know of at least 17 different research and development projects that have been canceled. So these are games that somebody at Riot thought was a good idea, and then we said, well, not good enough, and and was canceled, right? And over this process of coming up with new ideas, testing them, and, and um, just iterating, et cetera, et cetera. We, we suddenly found ourselves a couple years ago with a couple of games that would be ready in 2020 and a, and a game that if we really push hard that we could get it ready in 2020. So that me meant in 2019, we celebrated our 10 year anniversary and said, hey, let's, let's get everybody excited about the next great phase of Riot Games. So um, that is when we announced Runeterra, Valorant, and Wild Rift, um, and also gave some sneak peeks on to the additional projects that are coming out over the next year. Um, with regards to uh, Arcane, the TV show, um, it's, it's one of those things where we all grew up watching TV shows or movies based on video games, based on IP that we love, right? And I think deep down, every one of us as a gamer wants to be able to do that. And we're hoping that Arcane will be our entry into the growing field of um, storytelling formats about, you know, like these characters that everybody is very, very emotionally connected to. Yeah, that sounds super exciting. And definitely we've seen obviously anime and animations being a big part of sort of the gaming community. So I think that's going to be super exciting. One of the uh, particular games I wanted to touch upon, because I guess it's more relevant for the region is around sort of Wild Rift, right? Obviously, there's been a lot of hype around sort of mobile gaming, mobile gaming adoption, and esports 
mobile esports within the Southeast Asian region. Can you share a little bit more sort of um, the plans for Wild Rift for next year and sort of uh, what, what your views are around this game coming into this region, given sort of the excitement and, and, and the huge potential player base that's available here? Yeah. <laughs> Wild Rift is the new hotness. And I say that not only because it's my job to say it's new hotness, but I believe it's a new hotness, right? If you look at this DNA, you've got the biggest esport in the world, coupled with the biggest gamer base in the world, which is the mobile phone. And you don't see that player base more energized than in Southeast Asia, right? So when you put these two things together, then it's almost like the pressure of expectations will, like, is incredibly immense because everybody expects it to be a great experience. And we, we're we really optimistic, but we're also terrified because those expectations are huge and we work really, really hard to be worthy of those expectations. Now, you add on to it esports, where Riot has long-term been the biggest proponent of esports globally. Riot, we have brought esports not just to Asia, or uh, North America, but Latin America, Russia, Australia, all around the world, we've been really pioneering not just the distribution of a globally integrated competitive scene, but also changing the way esports work and you know, like the way that you can spectate and observe and participate in communities. We are looking at Southeast Asia and Hong Kong not only to be the first place where we push really hard with Wild Earth esports, but also to give us some data points and visibility on what are the innovations that we need to do to not to really inspire, excite the first generation of mobile esports players. Because we're really at the starting line everywhere. And I think Hong Kong especially has like a you know pole position at that uh, starting line. And I'm not an F1 guy, so I hope I got the racing metaphor correct. But yeah, it, it's super exciting because we're inventing the future right now. Cool. And I guess just a follow up question from there, obviously, you know, for Riot, a big focus has always been around the esports scene. Like, uh, can you share a little bit more? I'm not sure if you're allowed to, but if you're allowed to, whatever details you can around sort of what the esports plans are for Wild Rift potentially next year or into the future around sort of how you guys are looking to structure it around the region and sort of your thoughts around its, its sort of growth path and how it's going to support the game. It's, it's a challenging thing to share something that's not quite ready to be shared. Mm -hmm. Right. And, um, and, and like, I get asked this all the time, right? Like the questions are, will there be a Wild Rift Esports? What does it look like? Where will be the first championship be? All these great questions that I really want to answer. And the only thing I can say is we will talk about it when they're ready to be talked about. And, um, and, and we hope that people can anticipate and understand our challenges, um, and be patient for us because when we talk about things, we're able to like really articulate the philosophy behind why we make these decisions and get get a lot of people excited, right? So um, news will be coming soon on this front, Sean. Um, mm -hmm. I think that you know the people of Hong Kong and the people of Southeast Asia will be super excited about what we have planned, but right now it's not ready to be released. Cool. But well, that sounds super exciting. There might be some uh, interesting developments over the next couple of months, which is great. Um, just moving on to sort of a little bit about League of Legends, you mentioned in your presentation around sort of the Pacific Championship Series and sort of the plans. Obviously, that kicked off last year, and obviously PSG Talent was a part of it, and we were very happy to be a part of it. Just wanted to share, um, just wanted to discuss a little bit more about what are your thoughts around sort of the plans for 2021 and just developing forward around sort of how we want to push the PCS League and and, and, and whether it be on the viewership or on the marketing side, what are your thoughts around sort of some of the new initiatives that you guys are going to be pushing into? into the new so it was a tough year, right? Because <laughs> like, um, COVID and being distributed and, and like where everybody had to be separated. But if you think about launching a new league in a year like 2020, you would say people are being crazy, right? And I think despite all of the chaos outside of the game world, the PCS was able to get a good-sized audience and also send two pretty strong teams to the World Championships and made a big noise and said, oh, wow, PCS players are here to compete, right? So that momentum allows us to draft on it and continue to build on fandom so that we have new, new clubs in our ecosystem like yourself, Sean, where people will be like, oh, I like 
the, the philosophy of this team where they're about talent development, where they're also a little bit trolly with the memes. Right? <laughs> um, but like, it, it's like if the first year is about saying like, hey, we're here, we're serious, we're here to play, we're here to win, um, do not underestimate us. The second year is for each different team to find their base of audiences, et cetera, and, and my role and Ryan's role is to get greater distribution, more viewership, et cetera, so that we can quickly catch up to the to where other more established leagues are, right? Like year one was good, year two will be much more ambitious. And we're really hoping that year two will be much easier for us from a public health logistics travel point of view. And I think everybody on this call is praying for that as well, right? Yeah, for sure. I think, you know, it's always going to be difficult on, on the COVID backdrop and, you know, who knew what was going on, right, with all the travel bans and all the countries in Asia restricting certain visas and things like that. I think it was uh, logistically going to be a difficult task, but I think I completely agree with you. I think having the three broadcasts that we did in English, Chinese and Thai and having all the teams be able to compete, you know, some of them obviously in the same location, some of them remotely, I think was always going to be a difficult task, but it was very, very good. And I think the whole world's experience as well. I mean, congrats to the right team. I think that was an amazing effort given, you know, how many countries and teams were coming together in order to participate in that tournament. And I think the show in the end was, was really, really cool. I was actually in Shanghai during that time, I had a chance to go. And I must say, you know, the city of Shanghai really embraced it. Um, a lot of cool things that were happening around the city and there was a lot of hype and energy. So, um, yeah, that was really, really cool. Yeah, and I completely agree. I think there's going to be, I think looking into next year, I'm super excited to be um, a part of the PCS as well, particularly here at PSG Talent. We have a pretty interesting roster that we're going to announce, but we won't announce it yet until next week. I have a whole bunch of nice memes that we'll be pushing out to, um, to share with everyone about the roster. And I completely agree. You know, our objective uh, with Riot is to build the PCS region up into the same level and standards as our competitors regionally. And a lot of that is around sort of player retention, uh, development, as well as finding young talent and pushing them through, and then having great performances domestically so that people can watch. And also when we get onto the international stage, that so we can really show fans that the players within our region, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Macau, plus Southeast Asia, um, are very talented, right? And we do have a lot of really, really good players that are capable of being world beaters. And, and that's happened in the past, right? For our region, obviously the TPA has done that in I think it's season two or three, right? So um, I think it's repeatable and that's that's super exciting. So yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be awesome. I'm looking forward to it, I guess. And it should be really cool to see all the teams returning and, and competing and then obviously seeing how the seasons will play out. Obviously we have a lot of strong teams within the PCS and which teams will deliver championships and which will go to Worlds and MSI. So it should be fun. At, at the end of the day, like I think some of the most compelling sports narratives and where the deepest fan them comes from is the surprising underdog and the dark horse. And our teams in the region, including yours, came in as the dark horse, right? And for those of you who didn't follow our world championship in 2020, like only half of like Sean's team was able to show up at the tournament and because they were delayed because of COVID and they had to like, just like rush and find substitute players. And one of the players wasn't even, hadn't been a professional player for like a year and still they battled through, right? And it's almost like a Disney movie. Um, and that those kind of narratives, like our region continues to demonstrate that you don't have to be the biggest region in the world to be able to be a contender, to be a champion, right? That kind of heart, and that kind of discipline to focus on hard work will, like that's what we're looking for and that's what we can continue to develop. And we see that across all of our markets, including Hong Kong, including Thailand, et cetera, right? Um, and, and fans, they love it as well. They also love the, the meme trolley jokes as well, Sean, so please continue those, right? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll touch a little bit upon that and I think uh, we'll probably have to wrap it up, but the, you know, one thing that we we discussed with Riot at the start of, I guess, the end of last year around going into this season was, you know, from the content side, can we mix it up a little bit? Because I think if you look at uh, some of the top esports teams globally, like G2 Esports and uh, TL and Cloud9, a lot of their content is very much on the meme side and a lot of, a little bit of smack talk, right? And I think it's, it's acceptable sort of behavior between esports teams. And obviously, 
we adopted a little bit of that going into this year and obviously in the world scenario as well. And I think it's been incredibly successful simply because I don't know, people like to see a little bit of bit of bit of fun with memes. And I think it's something that um, more and more teams should be doing it in our region and it should be more fun heading into next year to have some of these narratives and some of these uh, a little bit of fun banter between the teams to continue to build the rivalries. Thank you very much, Chris and Sean, for the wonderful sharing. Now it's time to review the answer of our trivia. The correct answer is D, all of the above. League of Legends is 12th in the most marketable sports properties list.